Good afternoon. This is Doug Shadell, State Director for AARP Washington. I'd like to welcome you to an exciting Teletown Hall with our featured guests, Washington State Governor Jay Inslee and Washington State Insurance Commissioner Mike Kreidler. We will be discussing a topic that is on everyone's mind these days, health care. You know, since 1957, AARP has made access to quality and affordable health care for all one of its top public policy priorities, and this year is no different. On today's call, we will be highlighting the incredible progress Washington State has made in providing quality, affordable health care to a growing number of Washingtonians and the challenges we face um, together to keep these improvements going. Among those challenges facing our health care system are poorly constructed policy proposals currently under consideration in Congress that threaten to derail the progress that's been made and which would force millions of people to lose their existing coverage. This Teletown Hall that you're on right now is intended to be interactive, and we would love for you to participate in it by asking questions of our guests. So if you'd like to ask a question of either Governor Inslee or Commissioner Kreidler, all you have to do is press star three on your telephone now, and you will be connected to a live operator who is standing by to take your call. You will then be put in the queue to ask a question of our guests. Now, we can't guarantee that we will be able to answer every question, but we're committed to getting to as many of them as possible. And again, to ask a question on this call, press star three on your telephone keypad now. We will be hearing from the governor and Commissioner Kreider momentarily, but first I'd like to just say a few words about some of the things AERP is doing here in Washington State. For example, did you know AERP Washington has over 1,000 volunteers throughout the state? Who, will be, who are willing to do your taxes for free? That's right. As we approach that dreaded deadline of April 15th, the AARP tax aid program is in full swing, and you can get help by visiting our website at www.aarp.org. Also, we have hundreds of volunteers who offer driver safety classes through the state on a regular basis for individuals over age 50 who'd like to brush up on their driving techniques. Many insurance companies offer a discount for those who complete the AARP driver safety training, and you can now complete the class online. In addition, AARP's Fraud Watch Network provides education, outreach, and peer counseling to individuals so they can avoid being defrauded by scam artists. Later this year, we will be traveling the state with a new anti-fraud initiative called Unmasking the Imposters with Washington State Attorney General Bob Ferguson, experts from Microsoft's Digital Crime Unit, and officials from the Federal Trade Commission to warn people about the flood of imposters who are targeting consumers with various scams. And finally, AERP has fun events that we sponsor on a regular basis. For example, our Movies for Grownups program offers AERP members free attendance at new movies periodically throughout the Seattle area. And you can learn more about all of this and all of our activities here at AERP Washington State by visiting our website. Again, that address is www.aarp.org forward slash WA. So if you're just joining us, my name is Doug Shadell, State Director for AARP Washington. We will soon be joined by Washington State Insurance Commissioner Mike Kreidler and Governor Jay Inslee. And during this town hall, we will be talking about recent health care proposals being considered in Congress and how such proposals may impact your health care. You'll want to stay on the line and learn, among other things, how your insurance premiums could increase dramatically, how Medicaid's ability to provide long-term care could be threatened. Um, and if you would like to ask a question, press star three on your keypad to be connected to an AARP staff member who will note your name and question. We have almost 2,000 people on the call already, and um, I am speaking you, to you from our offices in Seattle. My name is Doug Shadell, State Director. Thank you for joining me with this conversation with Insurance Commissioner Mike Kreidler and Governor Jay Ensler. Mike Kreidler, um, who is with us now, is Washington's eighth insurance commissioner, a former member of Congress. He was first elected as insurance commissioner in 2000. He was reelected to a fifth term in 2016, and he has held many other prominent positions as a leader in the state of Washington throughout his storied career. And joining the commissioner in Olympia this afternoon is AERP advocacy director Kathy McCall and a group of AERP volunteer leaders. We're going to be talking to the commissioner and governor about health care, as I mentioned. Um, and again, I'm going to just say this one more time, and you'll hear me say this throughout the call. If you'd like to pose a question for the governor or Commissioner Kreidler, press star three on your telephone keypad to be connected. Commissioner Kreidler, first of all, welcome to our Teletown Hall. Are you there? 
waiting for Commissioner. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here. <laughs> great, great. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd just like to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us here today. Uh, and um, we just started the call, and as I mentioned, we have almost 2,000 people already on the line, so this is obviously people want to talk to you, Commissioner. Um, I also want to thank you for your continued uh, for continuing to be such a visible and powerful advocate on behalf of older people and really everyone in the state who's impacted by health care. And to get us started, you have someone in the room there I know, our, my colleague Mike Tucker, who's a AARP volunteer state president, and I think we'll start off by having Mike ask you a question. Mike, are you there? I am. Can you hear me okay, Doug? Yep, I sure can. Go ahead. Commissioner Kreidler, I've got a three-part question. Uh, first, Republicans have said that ACA, the Affordable Care Act, is failing. Is that the case in Washington? Secondly, now that the repeal bill has failed in Congress, where do we stand? Uh, what should we be watching for? And then lastly, are there any steps that we here in Washington should be taking to improve the Affordable Care Act and specifically the rising costs of health care and prescription drugs? Well, thank you. We certainly have been through some tumultuous weeks here uh, leading up to, to where we are today, and I think we're all very appreciative of a t uh, an opportunity to kind of regroup uh, and where we're at right now with what's happening at the national level and certainly even here at the state level. Um, you know, I, I certainly heard the, a number of uh, times that they referenced to uh, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, that it was uh, failing. Uh, that's certainly not true here in the state of Washington. We've, and I think I'd like to just go through and give a quick run through as sure. just exactly what, what we've been able to accomplish here at the state level and what maybe we can do next. Um, the key to our success here in the state of Washington has been that we wound up doing uh, a full embracing of the Affordable Care Act. We, we, we took all the steps necessary uh, to expand, to uh, create a health insurance exchange, not allow older policies to continue uh, in the market so you diluted the, the risk pool. Uh, we took a number of steps that really helped to strengthen what we, we have in that the number of uninsured in the state of Washington have dropped from 14% down to 5.8%. Uh, so a significant number now of people, largely the major share of that, of course, being but a much smaller number now of people without uh, health insurance. We also have good competition uh, in, in, the, in our market. Uh, that's something that wasn't true for a number of other states. And accomplish in the state of Washington and, and certainly even try to make it even stronger. Um, so I, so, but uh, one, one of the things that, that uh, now kind of looking, looking back to kind of see where we stand right now, we've got all this incredible record of what we did with, with Medicaid uh, with, 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 the, uh, and with the Affordable Care Act and its expansion and, 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 in, in, and having it employed in the state of Washington. But where do we stand right now? Uh, just a, a week later since the, the, the House uh, uh, Republicans uh, uh, dropped their challenge to, to the Affordable Care Act. As a result of that, we, we now have um, uh, a very different uh, situation, uh, one with, that does offer some opportunities where we could actually move forward and, uh, and maybe work in a bipartisan fashion going forward. I hope that's where we're at right now because there are some real oppor opportunities out there. So I'd have to say I may be cautiously optimistic right now going forward. Uh, but we must remain uh, very vigilant uh, going forward because uh, there are still opportunities here. There's still talk about uh, bringing back the bill and they have, uh, that the Republicans had, the uh, uh, American Health Care Act, and seeing if that would be to bring it back in some fashion. Uh, there's uh, there's uh, going to be continued talk like that, but on top of it, I probably worry more uh, about what they're going to do on an administrative side um, from the standpoint of, uh, of what they can do through Congress, but also how they can undermine the Affordable Care Act through uh, administrative actions. One of those being, uh, are they going to uh, enforce the insurance mandate? 
uh, it's very important that you get both good risk and bad risk into the market. Uh, if you just get the bad risk in, insurance is pretty expensive. You've got to have good risk and bad risk. All insurance markets operate that way. And that's, that's where we're at right now, of wanting to make sure that they're going to continue with a mandate that is functional and working, and we don't have a guarantee of that at this point that they're going to do that. Um, there's also a, a court case that hangs out there, House v. Uh, Price right now. This is where uh, the House Republicans against uh, the uh, Obama administration uh, that wanted to find that, that they couldn't offer uh, subsidies to reduce uh, co-pays and deductibles. Um, and that legislation uh, in a lower court held that, that, the, uh, the, that uh, the Obama administration needed an appropriation by Congress to move forward to keep that in place. Uh, as a result, uh, the administration under President Obama challenged uh, the question right now is that that court decision has been put off to late May uh, by agreement of the Tr Trump administration and, uh, and the House Republicans. Uh, and uh, the real question is, are they going to vigorously follow up on that lawsuit, or are they going to allow it to essentially uh, defer to the lower court decision? That lower court decision ran against uh, uh, allowing those uh, uh, co-pays and deductibles to go forward. That would have a very significant negative impact on the Affordable Care Act, perhaps even to the point of collapsing markets. Um, there's, there's uh, the, the, the House, uh, the, the Congress itself needs to get on to uh, budget decisions that are before them. They've got a continuing uh, resolution that they that uh, allows them to operate. That's going to uh, they have to make a decision by the April 28th, and so they've got that pressure on them. Uh, I'm hoping while well, that's taking place and they're doing that, uh, the Trump administration uh, doesn't drop the uh, appeal of that court case uh, and, and that or that Congress steps up and actually uh, appropriates the money, which would resolve the case and it would go away. Failing to do that again, as I said, would have a very negative impact on the market. One of the things that I worry a lot about as insurance commissioner is how the insurers are viewing all of this activity. Are they getting nervous to the point where they potentially would back out of the market in the individual market uh, where they would uh, no longer choose to write? We had a bad experience like that back in the 1990s in the state of Washington. Uh, we don't need to see that replicated again because it's very hard on individuals if that market, because that's in individual insurance for themselves. So they're anxious and they're nervous. Uh, what, what I would be hoping for is that uh, as we move forward that uh, we, we wind up working on, on uh, activities together, such as perhaps doing something to uh, uh, have a reinsurance program for the health insurers that it helps to lessen the, the potential that they could uh, have major losses as an insurance company. If they start to feel that kind of fear, they'll back out of the market. Um, I do see some places where we can work together, and I, and I think one of them is certainly uh, that even here at the state level, we can work on, on choice and affordability of plans and work together to see if we could do that, uh, and that would be certainly something that would help strengthen uh, the, the uh, Affordable Care Act. Now, the other, another act thing that we could wind up doing would be to expand the tax credits to say that that, it was the, that group that would, were going to be the ba major beneficiaries under the under Trump Care, um, and what but they were the lower income lower income seniors and uh, in addition to that lower income younger uh, uh, people that would have been the, the losers. If we could work to do something more for that working middle class uh, that uh, is a little bit better off, I think it really helps to. Uh, to solidify uh, th their uh, participation in the in the uh, Affordable Care Act. Now, one other activity, which is probably definitely would be much more of it at the national level, would be prescription drugs and the cost. Uh, I feel very strongly that uh, because I look at the the filings that we got 
for 2017 that are out there being marketed right now. Prescription drugs for the rate increases that uh, we experience. And, you know, even President Trump has talked about he'd like to lower the prices on, on drugs. I think this is where a chance where we could work together, you know, allow Medicare to get prices. And you literally could save hundreds of billions of dollars over the next decade if you allowed that to take place. Um, I think that's, that's, that's one where I'm certainly willing, and I think uh, the people of like mind of wanting to make sure they're helping people will, will come together and, and see if we can't work together to tackle issues like this, and certainly one of the major ones here being the pharmaceuticals that I just mentioned. Um, and that would be a bipartisan effort, to, to be sure. Um, I'm work here at the state level, we're working very uh, successfully with our partner agencies in state government. In addition, along with our, our health insurance exchange, uh, to, to uh, coordinate with the data and impacts, understanding what's happening at the federal level, how it impacts us. And we're, so we're working very closely with them. Uh, we're, we're also monitoring. At the, at the, in, before the Congress, uh, any federal rulemaking or informal guidance that's coming down that could have a very significant impact uh, on the Affordable Care Act going forward. So this is what we're, we can do here uh, locally and certainly what I kind of see coming down if we make the right decisions at the national level in order to work together. One other thing I'd like to mention is that that the proposed federal budget uh, has a, a major cut to a program that is in my office, the State Health Insurance Benefit Advisors, SHIBA program. Uh, they, they cut that program by, uh, would effectively take away all of the money that comes to us. It allows us to work with over 400 very highly trained state volunteers around the state of Washington, and, and uh, we've Last year, 88,000 people with free and un unbiased uh, advice about Medicare. Uh, I'd certainly hate to see that go away, where you th all, the only thing that you would have available at that point would be a 1-800-Medicare phone number, someplace uh, if that number would go, as opposed to getting advice from highly trained volunteers right here in our own communities. So if, if you agree with this, this I'd certainly... AARP members to reach out to their members of Congress, uh, indicate their support for continuing the funding for the SHIBA program going forward. It's a big, big plus. It's actually one of our sponsors that we have in the state. We have multiple sponsors, but AARP directly is a sponsor in some communities. With that, thank you very much for an opportunity to be here. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mike. If you're just joining us, that was Mike Kreidler, uh, Insurance Commissioner for the State of Washington. Um, and you're listening to a Teletown Hall with AARP. We will be joined by the governor shortly. Um, and if you'd like to ask a question of the governor or the commissioner, press star three on your telephone keypad. And uh, before we go to calls, I'd like to give the audience, we have almost over 5,000 people on the line right now, the opportunity to participate in a survey question. You heard Commissioner Kreidler talking about prescription drugs and the high cost of drugs. Um, we're going to give you a chance to vote on an, the answer to a question. And the way you participate here is very simple. You just press on your keypad the number corresponding to the answer you would like to give for this survey question. So here we go. I'm going to read you a question, then give you a chance to vote on your telephone keypad. And the question is this. For many years, the Veterans Administration has been allowed to negotiate prescription drug prices with drug companies, which has resulted in veterans being able to buy drugs for significantly less than the rest of us. Would you support allowing the state and federal government to negotiate prescription drug prices on behalf of Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries in order to lower the cost of prescription medications? If you think the answer is yes, press 1 on your telephone keypad. If you think the answer is no, press 2. And if you're not sure, press three. And we'll give you a minute to vote. Again, this is about would you like the state and the federal government to be able to negotiate prescription drug prices with the pharmaceutical companies to lower the cost of your prescription Medicaid? Press one for yes, press two for no. 
And I think we're going to take a call. Commissioner, we have a call from Richard Yarnson. You're live with the commissioner. Do you have a question? Yes, I was wondering about of the 750,000 people that took new insurance options uh, at the end of the year, 600,000 got uh, took the Medicaid option for uh, assistance and paying for their premiums. Uh, but does this put them in the Medicaid system where they would get long-term care and et cetera? This, this, this would be an expansion to single adults um, that would be picked up uh, and covered through the, through the Medicaid program that, that, that is the 600,000 people we're talking about here. Um, the, the individuals that would be, let's say, uh, eligible for a traditional Medicaid, uh, which would be uh, seniors and, uh, uh, and individuals with disabilities, um, uh, women and children, th they would be outside of that 600. This is just the expansion to single adults. You know, we've done a fantastic job of, of uh, covering women and children uh, and certainly seniors. In fact, uh, if you take a look at the entire Medicaid program, two-thirds of it goes to individuals that are, that are uh, um, disability received the received the benefits from traditional Medicaid. So it's it's been a program that helped the, the old and the young. Uh, the expansion of the Medicaid program was picking up the group that was left in between, and it's had a huge positive impact. Not only have we wound up with, uh, with uh, reducing the amount of uncompensated care tremendously in the state of Washington, largely because of this expansion, we've cut it from over uh, $2 billion a year before the Affordable, Affordable Care Act to near a billion dollars now, so almost a 50% reduction uh, in the total number of people that are, that are amount of dollars, I should say, that are covered, uh, um, paid for now. It's had a very positive impact overall. Well, thank you for that answer, Commissioner. Um, we have our poll results in, and I don't think anybody will be surprised by this, although I am surprised by the extent of it. 88% say they believe we should be able to negotiate prices with the pharmaceutical companies, and only 2% say no, and 10 are not sure. So overwhelmingly, the people on this call at least, and there's over, almost 6, 000, over 6,000 people now, um, uh, believe that we should be able to negotiate for lower prescription drugs. Let's take another call now from Debbie. You're on the air with Commissioner Kreidler. Uh, yes, thank you. I appreciate your taking these calls and having this forum. Uh, my concern was that I had a very difficult time finding providers, uh, uh, preferred providers, on any of the insurance plans. Um, how do we get and keep good doctors available for the different plans? I, I finally found a doctor within 50 miles of me this month. So January and February I could use no insurance because I couldn't find a provider. You know, this this is always a challenge, and I think but one of the advantages we have right now, if you're in the individual market and you're selecting your own health insurance plan, you have an opportunity to go in and take a look at uh, what kind of provider network is available to you. And, and I think that's all. People, uh, the, the doctor, the hospital, the clinic, uh, that you are con want to go to or have gone to in the past, and you have a chance to go in and do that kind of uh, of comparison. That is probably the biggest challenge. One of the things that we wound up doing in my office that again helped the Affordable Care Act in its implementation was that we wound up uh, uh, having network standards for health insurers. So we we go through very carefully to make sure that they have enough doctors and hospitals and, and that the, the doctors and hospitals they have listed actually have appointments that are open so that when you call you can actually see it's listed there and we've done so very aggressively more so than any other state in the nation in fact we really became a model for what other states have wound up doing um, as kind of a model of what you can do with network uh, because it, it became very clear we needed to have have something like that in place. 
Okay, great. Thank you, Commissioner Kreidler. Uh, we'll take another call, and we're, we're awaiting the governor. He should be here soon. Uh, but this is your chance to talk to Commissioner Kreidler. Uh, Billy, you're on the air. Hi. Um, okay. Um, well, my question is, um, I don't understand why you allow insurance companies to come in and only write for people in the big counties like King, Pierce, and Snohomish, and then there's people in, say, Grant County, Skamania County, whatever, the little places where they have, if they're lucky, two choices of who they can choose for their coverage. And I just, I don't understand why that's allowed. It seems like to me if, if somebody wants to write insurance in the state of Washington, then they should write insurance in the whole state of Washington. We can't dictate to the insurance companies of whether they even offer health insurance, much less which counties they have to go to. We strongly encourage that they want, wind up uh, do offering uh, health insurance around the state. The Care Act was enacted. We had a tough time in rural areas of the state of Washington and being able to get enough enough insurers to, to participate in those markets. So what we're seeing here is really uh, a recognition that, that in those rural counties you have a limited number of providers. It's very difficult to put together adequate networks. Uh, and Frequently the costs to the insurer are considerably higher than they are in the more urban areas where you closer range of four doctors and hospitals than you do in those rural communities. So it, there, it, it's, it's a challenge. I think it's one that we need to work on. One, one thing is maybe that's where we take a look and say if, if we have a real problem with insurers in, in uh, certain rural counties and we can't get the insurers to come there, maybe we should take a look and see if there's a possibility a, uh, single payer like uh, Medicare uh, expanded in those counties so that uh, they have uh, a better choice. Uh, something like that might be what we have to, where we have to go, but it's been an age-old problem, uh, and unfortunately, uh, we still have those challenges even under the Affordable Care Act. It's just that it isn't any worse than it used to be. I'd like to see it get better, though. <clears throat> Thank you for that answer. Um, and if you're just joining us, uh, this is Doug Shadell from AERP, and you're listening to a Teletown Hall with Insurance Commissioner Mike Kreidler, who you just heard. Um, and we are now joined by Governor Jay Inslee. Uh, welcome, Governor. Um, hello. Thanks, AARP. Congratulations on the success that AARP has had uh, saving us from all the damage that was considered in Washington, D.C. recently, uh, the mobilization of your people to speak up against a really terrible bill that would have had a grievous adverse impacts on so many senior citizens, and I include myself, I've, I've now turned 66, I'm rapidly approaching my IQ, so uh, I'm very concerned about these issues. <laughs> And uh, I was very concerned about this effort to reduce the protection of senior citizens that Medicaid affords, particularly we had, a, we had 150,000 people in our state who were over the age of 50 who were eligible for Medicaid, and they were jeopardized by this that would have eventually eliminated their coverage. And, uh, you know, health care is always important. I can care when you're 66 than we did when we were 26, so we understand what was at risk. And the reason this was blocked was because the voices were raised, phone calls, and members of Congress finally got the message, which is don't touch my health care. So it was a great result. Hats off to ARP and people on this call who cared enough <coughs> to really prevent this outrage. And it was an outrage because essentially this bill was a disguised tax plan masquerading as a health care bill. So that's the good news. Um, but we, we do need to remain diligent. Improvement. And we have had real improvement. We've reduced uninsurance rates by more than half. We've reduced un, uh, uncompensated care by more than half. We've reduced the rate of medical inflation for 16 to 6%. So our state's really showing the rest of the country how to do this right. 
and ARP has been instrumental partner to to help spread information that seniors could have while they can protect themselves. Now we have some threats on the state level as well. As you know, we have a budget challenge in our state in our effort to fund uh, schools. And we're gonna make sure we get that done to fund the education of our kids, but we don't wanna do it in the healthcare of our seniors or anyone else. And I am concerned because one of the budgets that have been put forward by the Republicans here would refuse to fund uh, our Medicaid waiver program that people, including help us integrate our mental health and our physical health systems and help people with opioid and alcohol programs and, and, and help people to reduce uh, homelessness as well. I hope that the Republicans will come to the table and negotiate a resolution that will allow us to move forward with our Medicaid waiver and do some of the proactive things that are so important, not only to seniors, but kids and people with mental health challenges. So I hope that that gets worked out. So uh, I'm hoping to stand for some easy questions here or general yes. criticisms. Those are important too. <laughs> well, thank you, Governor. And, and we just want to uh, say right back at you and your support of um, opposition to the bill. Uh, we did all we could, but you certainly came out against it as well. And uh, both you and Commissioner Kreidler are really uh, leading the charge here in, in um, the, placing importance on health care. Before we take some questions, I want to do one more polling question, and you might be interested in the results of this, Governor. We're going to ask a question about um, long-term care costs, and then we'll get to the phones. How's that? Give you a chance to settle in there. Um, time for another poll question, and uh, I'll remind you that it's simple as pressing the number on your keypad to correspond to the answer. Here's the question. Um, and we have over 7,000 people on the phone right now, so we should get some answers, some good data from this. Studies show that a majority of us will need long-term care services at some point in our lives, but the costs for such services are skyrocketing, with annual costs for some nursing homes approaching $100,000 per year. Thinking about your own situation now, which of the following best describes how, to, how you plan to pay for long-term care in the future? And I'll just go down the list, press the number that corresponds to the way you're going to pay for your long-term care. One, Medicare will pay for it. Two, personal savings will pay for it. Three, I have no idea how I'm going to pay for it. Four, private long-term care insurance. Five, friends and family. Let me read that list again. One, Medicare will pay for it. Two, personal savings will pay for it. Three, I have no idea four, private long-term care insurance, five, friends and family. And we hope to have the results of that poll um, in a minute. Let's go to the phones now, though, and we'll go to Jim. J Jim, you're on the line with the governor. Hello, I'm here. Go ahead. You have a yeah, question? First, I would really like to thank uh, Governor Inslee for you know what you are doing and what kind of leadership you are giving to our state. Um, it's very important. Um, my question is here. I'm very concerned about Congressman Newhouse and how he's just following uh, the Republican Party line in, in Washington. I see the problem being more with uh, the power of the insurance company lobby and how you know they're um, cutting deals with them. I've contacted Congressman Newhouse on several occasions with my concerns. All I get back from him is a form letter. Um, I'm concerned for the future of the health care for those people who enrolled in the Affordable Care Act. Is there any way to influence this, you know, uh, Congressman Newhouse's decision making other than writing him? I don't want to see the Affordable Care Act explode. <coughs> He's fine tuned. Um, the alternative is returning back to using emergency rooms as primary care for a lot of people. And so, and then my last thing is, how can we get him to come home and meet face to face with his constituents, and what can we do to help? Well, Jim, um, that question, except to tell you that uh, citizens have the right to voice their opinions with their representatives. It's something I did uh, when I represented Central Washington sometimes, but I always felt that that was part of the job and it was an important part to 
give people access to their representatives. I guess what I could tell you is I wouldn't give up efforts to share your views with your representative. Impact. I know we had one Republican, Jamie Herrera Butler, who uh, broke with her party and voted or said she would vote against uh, the bill that that uh, we thought would be so destructive. People were diligent in sharing their views with her. I don't know for sure. I guess what I would say is you should you have the right to continue to be vocal, and I hope uh, that that will be uh, successful. Oh, thank but you, I'm Governor. Gonna... Uh, we'll have another. We have another question on the line. Um, go ahead. You're, you're uh, Lauren from Vancouver. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Do you have a question for the governor? I do, Governor. Um, I'm on Medicare, and I'm a senior citizen. But my question is, if the Republicans are successful in dumping a lot of the responsibility of health care onto the states, how are the states, that are many, many of whom are bankrupt, going to take care of the people? Well, I've taken the position that we should fight these efforts to uh, take away Medicaid from Americans, and we should not uh, give uh, the Congress or Republicans an excuse for dumping these people, tossing them overboard. So I've just not even sort of continence consideration of how to do that because it shouldn't happen. And, and that strategy has worked so far, and I believe ultimately will work because even Republican governors have told Congress there were four Republican governors who wrote Congress who said this would be ridiculous to uh, to uh, take away Medicaid coverage. We don't have the money laying in the back, the back door of the governor's residences to take care of the billions of dollars. It would be about a billion and a half dollars a year to the state of Washington. And there's just no, you know, tin can full of money to, to pay for that in our state. So I think the best strategy is the one we've pursued so far which is to not allow the Republicans to take away health care from Americans. And those voices have worked uh, to date, and I would predict will continue to work because Congress got both barrels from Republicans and Democrats alike, and they had to, they had to retreat and give up. And that's what they've done, and it's a good thing. That's great. Well, if you're just joining us, uh, we're talking with Governor Jay Inslee and Commissioner Mike Kreidler. This is the AARP Town Hall on um, Health care, and I'll give you the results of the poll now. 22% um, of you said that Medicare would pay for your long-term care, which, by the way, I think we all agree will, it will not. <laughs> um, personal savings, 13%. Almost half of you said you have no idea how you're going to pay for long-term care, 44%. Private long-term care insurance, 17%. And friends and family, um, 4%. And so there you have it. Do you want to make any comment about that, Governor or uh, Commissioner Kreidler, about those poll results? A lot of people don't have any idea how they're going to pay for long-term care. Well, I, I think it's, it's one of – you're identifying one of the, the, the very important areas of making sure that uh, there are not compromises made uh, in the uh, Medicaid program, uh, traditional Medicaid program, particularly as it, as it helps seniors and those with disabilities. Um, uh, and it becomes the, the lifeline for, for the vast majority. Two-thirds of the people that are in nursing homes are going to be uh, people that are there through the Medicaid program. But the state of Washington, under the enlightened leadership of uh, Governor Inslee, uh, we've certainly seen a great deal more of an opportunity to, to allow individuals to have placement in something less than and still have payment for um, services outside of a, a nursing home, but still uh, providing critical long-term care services through the Medicaid program. That's something that I hope with the new administration is not compromised uh, going forward. And we're very innovative and in progress uh, making steps here in the right direction to help seniors. Okay. Yep. Governor Inslee, did you want to chime in yeah, there? Uh, well, one thing I want to say is that, you know, we've been in the rollout of health care, it's been a significant part because of Commissioner Kreidler's leadership. We've done a lot better in our state, not necessarily in long-term care, but in general. I, I wanted to make sure people, there's why we've led the country in some successes. 
uh, Mike's been really a great leader on this, and I thank him. I hope everybody does. Great. Um, uh, we have another caller now from someone named John Barnett. John? <laughs> yes. Uh, I read in the uh, New York Times this morning that there are uh, 74 million Americans on Medicaid. That's one in five uh, Americans, and that's more than the number of people on Medicare. Uh, my understanding is that the Medicaid is financed jointly from federal and state funds, and are you optimistic that we'll be able to continue uh, covering the number of people uh, on Medicaid in the future? Thank you. This is Jay. I am optimistic, again, because uh, overwhelm the Republican dreams of repealing Obamacare that they dreamed of doing and voted 42 times to do it, but then they couldn't do it. And I, I'm optimistic at this point. I have to tell you, uh, I think that their dreams of repealing it are, are finished. That's what I believe. But that doesn't mean we should be not diligent and observant. Okay. We have another question. Uh, Sharon Leavenworth. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, Commissioner Kreidler uh, earlier mentioned how the ACA can be undermined at the federal level, even though it's still in place by real rule changes, pulling funding, or things like marketing to encourage sign-ups, and then programs like SHIBA. So I'm wanting to know what we can do at the state level to help keep the Affordable Care Act working in our state, you know, to compensate for these um, death by a thousand cuts that I think are probably coming from the federal level. For example, you know, when will the legislature be making, our state legislature be making decisions on funding? Could they, could we apply pressure as citizens to increase funding for marketing and outreach and to fill in some of the funding gap for Sheba if that comes through, those sorts of things? How can we make a difference at the state level like we did nationally? Well, I, I think at this point, particularly when it comes to something like the Sheba program, it's one of putting pressure on Congress so that the proposed budget that's been put forward by the Trump administration is not uh, adopted or it's certainly amended uh, considerably from where it's at right now. So you don't do things like uh, Meals on Wheels program and things like this. I mean, it, that's it's a false savings. Um, so I, I think what what... what what all of us can do right now uh, is, is that we, we, we certainly monitor very closely what's happening at the federal level. Uh, we're going to be, through my office, uh, the insurance commissioner's office, we'll be very aggressive in making sure we get the information out to uh, valuable allies like AARP so that they know exactly what's taking place. And we'll be very quick to share this information with our congressional delegation. And we do this on a very uh, well-coordinated fashion of doing this monitoring. The uh, state agencies that report to, to Governor Inslee, State and, uh, Health Insurance Exchange, we all work together in a very collaborative fashion so that we have the most up-to-date information of the impact. So as we go forward, we're really doing everything we can to, to lessen the – making sure if they're going to do something really – ugly and uh, that they, they, they're going to be forewarned uh, that they're taking that step in advance, much like what we did right now in, in uh, tackling Trump Care, the American Health Care Act. We wanted to make what, what the trade-offs were. Okay. Um, David from Twist, you have a question. Yes, I do. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the taxpayers of the state of Washington and Governor Inslee and Mike Kreidler for their generosity in putting out Apple Care. Apple Care has been responsible for my grandson receiving the best prenatal care and birth care and postnatal care probably in the world, and I'm very grateful for that. My question um, has to do with uh, the, the sense, and, I, and I'm going to put you guys on the spot here, I think, the sense that it it, it makes to work with the private insurance industry, which Bloomberg News estimates has an initiative cost of anywhere from 19 to 25 percent, versus the federal Center for Medicaid and Medicare, which uh, Kaiser Health Services indicate has an um, administrative cost of, of merely 2 to 3 percent. I'm wondering why we continue to invest in private insurance uh, when it continues to increase costs and when its administrative costs bleed off a lot of money that could be going actually into the system to provide health care and savings for prescription medication. Thank you. 
Uh, this is Jay. Uh, I, what I would just say is we believe, you know, we got 600,000 people whose health care is dependent on our ability to save. Act, and I'm focused intensely on that battle right now. There may be other issues of the kind you brought up, but today, I mean, we're obviously not going to pass a Medicare for all bill through the Republicans in the Senate and House right now, much less the president. So we need to focus on the battle that is before us and make sure we win this. Now, I expressed optimism that the Congress will be unsuccessful repealing the Affordable Care Act. But I am concerned about the president sabotaging it through executive action or inaction. That is a real concern. If, for instance, he says, if he went out tomorrow and says he won't enforce any mandate or help us in marketing at all, that could uh, really damage our ability to continue a viable, more private markets. So I, I guess what I'm saying is I understand the, the uh, reason to think we could do this a lot uh, more efficiently in a different way, but we got to focus on winning this battle right now and have a unified approach to stop them in their tracks. And I think one of the ways to do this is to make sure – that we say this is Trump's responsibility right now. In a sense, this is Trump care right now. He can't walk away from it and allow it to say collapse, That's wash his hands of it. We gotta hold him responsible for it. And if it needs some fix, he ought to fix it. He ought not to sabotage it. You know, there was a guy, I remember he threw a paint scraper into the universal gear of a big Air Force carrier the other day. We should not allow Trump to do the same thing to health care. And, uh, that ought to be our focus. So that's the battle I'm focusing on right now. Thank you very much. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Go. That was Governor Jay Inslee from the state of Washington and Commissioner Mike Kreidler. And we are the AARP Teletown Hall. And we're going to continue to take a few calls. If you guys have got more time, I know you're very busy. We'll take a couple more calls. Uh, Margo from Camas. Yes. I'm calling you because I hit the donut hole usually by the end of February or the 1st of March, and I'm in that donut hole until October or maybe even November. And I worked all my life and that kind of stuff at the paper mill, but in about two or three years, my savings and everything is going to be gone, and I'll probably have to sell my home. Well, I, I certainly empathize with you with the, the problems associated with uh, the donut hall, and that's where uh, the Met, 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 Medicare program would cover uh, uh, prescription drugs early uh, under the Part D, and they'd cover them late. But in between, you were just left on your to, to your own devices, and that was enough to bankrupt a lot of people. Um, but fortunately, as a part of the Affordable Care Act, the, there's progress being made to close uh, that donut hole so that it doesn't exist. So it, so the opportunities to receive late uh, without a break it will will be part of the prescription drug uh, coverage benefit through through Medicare. So that's a positive sign. I also find it interesting. Uh, Ryan was very careful to make sure. He didn't step on the on the toes of closing the donut hall, uh, so I don't. I don't. So far, we haven't seen them make that foolish mistake. That was an astute move on his part, because he was going to invite the wrath of a lot of seniors. And since I'm one of them, I I would have been there joining you in protesting uh, any effort to to uh, not continue the effort to close that donut hall, which was truly unfortunate to exist in the first place. But it needs to go away. Well, thank you very much. This has uh, been a, just an absolutely illuminating conversation. I want to thank both Governor Jay Inslee and Commissioner Kreidler for their time this afternoon. We're going to have to wrap up this Teletown Hall, but I'm sure all of our listeners have enjoyed hearing you talk about the current state of health care. Any, any final comments from uh, maybe each of you could give just a short final closing comment before we sign <laughs> off? Oh, this is just Thank you, ARP, and thank you for people who are willing to stand up and speak up. We've seen de democracy in action where a really, really bad idea was killed by the voices of some smart folks. So keep it up. I look forward to 
I would echo the, the same up here from Mike Kreidler that uh, I'm very appreciative of the work that AARP has, has conducted, uh, the effort that they put into helping to put a bright light on what we're and the sacrifices and harm and hurt that it would perpetuate or allow to happen for the people of this country was invaluable. Uh, so ARP has played a very active and complete role here in making sure uh, that bad things don't happen. And as we go forward, we're going to apply the same degree of due diligence right now to make sure that nothing sneaky comes along that uh, is snuck in there that really does hurt people going forward. So thank you very much. Thanks very much. Appreciate all of your time. And to all of you who phoned in, thank you for your time today. This concludes our Teletown Hall. I um, want to thank our guests, Governor Jay Inslee and Insurance Commissioner Mike Kreidler, for taking the time out of their busy day to talk to us about health care. And if you would like to see our final poll results or keep up to date on activities of AARP Washington, you can visit our website at www.aarp.org forward slash wa. Good afternoon.